The coronavirus family contains many viruses that can be broken down into smaller groups called species. One such group is the severe acute respiratory syndrome related coronaviruses or SARS-CoVs. And within this species are two notable strains, the original SARS-CoV from 2003 and the more recent SARS-CoV-2. Each strain can have multiple variants. Variants emerge during virus replication through small changes in the genome called mutations. We have seen many variants over the course of this pandemic, and that's because viruses mutate, and SARS-CoV-2 mutates regularly. So we frequently see new variants emerging. It's just that most of these variants don't change how the virus behaves. And so there's no real selective advantage and no reason why these variants would propagate instead of any other variant. So we don't really pay a lot of attention to them, except for doing surveillance to make sure that we're not getting dangerous new mutations arising. But in the last six months, mutations have caused several worrying new variants to emerge around the world. Most recently, B1128 in Brazil, for which very little is still known. More studied are the two variants B117 identified in the UK and B1351 in South Africa. Scientists are worried about how rapidly these variants are spreading or what's known as their increased transmissibility. Basically, anything that affects how the virus replicates, how the virus is released from cells, and how effectively virus that, say, in the air can get into a new host and start a new infection, anything that increases how effectively the virus does that can increase transmissibility. One previous SARS-CoV-2 variant, D614G, has been found to be able to bind to human cells and enter them more successfully, suggesting increased transmissibility. It became the globally dominant strain in 2020. However, one recent study analysing over 46,000 genomes of SARS-CoV-2 found that the dominance of D614G was more likely due to what's known as the founder effect, where the variant emerged early in the pandemic and grew in frequency as the virus spread around the world. Variants can also get lucky, emerging alongside behaviour changes such as people going on holiday again, no longer wearing masks or socialising more readily. What do we know about the transmissibility of the B117 UK variant so far? The variant seems to transmit much more effectively, between 50 to 70 percent more efficiently than we've seen with previous variants. That is correlated based on what we've seen in terms of the epidemiology of the spread of this variant versus other variants within the UK and specifically the Southeast. And it looks like that variant is more transmissible, but we're really waiting on laboratory experiments to confirm that. What do we know about the B1351 South African variant so far? We know a lot less about the South African variant than we do about the UK variant. Now, we know that the variant has mutations also in the spike protein and in this receptor binding domain. So there's a very good likelihood that this variant is in fact also more transmissible and more transmissible because it binds better to this ACE2 molecule on human cells. But we don't know much more outside of that. ACE2 is a protein on the surface of human cells. It's found in our lungs, blood vessels, kidneys, liver, and even heart. The spike protein on the surface of SARS-CoV-2 binds to the ACE2 receptor like a lock and key. This is how the virus enters the human body. Genomic analysis of the B117 and B1351 variants can help provide clues about transmissibility, vaccine evasion, and disease severity through examining their mutations. In the case of B117, 17 of those mutations occurred all at once, an unprecedented amount in the COVID-19 pandemic to date. Most interest lies in mutations that occur within the genetic code for the spike protein, which the virus uses to enter human cells. Both variants have several changes in this region. One identical mutation they both share is at the 501st link in the spike's amino acid chain, called the N501Y mutation. 
This sits within an area called the receptor binding domain, where the spike binds to the protein ACE2 on human cells. The naming N501Y indicates that the amino acid N, known as asparagine, is being replaced by Y, known as tyrosine. Ravi Gupta, a professor of clinical microbiology at Cambridge University, has been investigating these mutations in both variants. 501Y was a, was a mutation that appears to um, increase the binding between the virus particle and the ACE2 receptor on the surface of cells. That's been uh, demonstrated. Um, it also uh, was associated with more um, severe infection when in a mouse model, but then again, mice are difficult to infect, and so it just it just helped the mice get infected. Along with N501Y, the South African variant B1351 has two further changes in this region, K417N and E484K. This is a trio of mutations that are in the receptor binding domain, which is a key target for our vaccine responses. And uh, there are a number of studies that show that 484 in particular can um, lead to a degree of immune escape from uh, serum, serum from uh, recovered individuals. It's a worrying indication that E484K may help the virus evade the body's immune response and weaken the effectiveness of vaccines. B117 does not share these mutations, but has other changes elsewhere in its spike protein. P681H, where amino acid histamine replaces proline, occurs on the edge of the region coding for the furin cleavage site. This cleavage site is unique to SARS-CoV-2, and is potentially one reason why it's more transmissible than the original SARS. It also has a deletion of two amino acids at 69 and 70. This has been found in other variants throughout the pandemic and often occurs alongside other significant mutations. This raises the question of whether it could be a combination of mutations that causes increased transmissibility in variants. So how did B117 gain so many mutations all at once? One theory comes from a paper exploring the treatment of chronic COVID-19 in immunosuppressed patients using convalescent plasma. This involves taking plasma from patients who have recovered from COVID-19 and giving it to those suffering with the disease to try and provide a form of artificial immunity. And that is perfect for the virus to then just keep going and then acquire mutations. So I think the biggest problem is chronic infection uh, as a source for these new variants. Um, chronic infection is most likely to be in the context of immune suppression. And we potentially could exacerbate those issues by giving people with terrible immune systems um, therapies such as convalescent plasma. But on the other hand, you know, there is a clinical need and people perceive that they need to be doing something to treat these individuals. And so we need to be doing such, um, if we're going to do this, we need to do it in a controlled environment where we minimize the risk of passing on those variants that are generated. The use of convalescent plasma as a treatment for COVID-19 has come under renewed scrutiny after researchers in the UK concluded a major study, finding that its use had no significant difference on patient outcomes. But it's not just convalescent plasma giving birth to these new dangerous variants. As SARS-CoV-2 continues to reach ever higher global case numbers, the power of virus evolution will continue to more rapidly create mutations that could change the course of the pandemic. This can be seen with the new variant B1128 in Brazil. This has some concerns about it because it has the 501 and 484 mutation. And then the third mutation it has is uh, position 417, which is also um, a mutated, uh, but a little bit differently in the South African strain. Um, so there's this different amino acid replacement, um, again, suggesting that this is, these are common mutations that the virus can pick on to do the thing that it needs to do, which is to escape immunity. So what can we do? We do need to step up the vaccine programs, you know, as, as fast as possible. And I think any vaccine, even if 50% protective, will be better than nothing. But we need to be following this up with better vaccines that cover these um, mutants that are targeting other parts of the virus as well. It's the next sort of phase of vaccination. With the initial hard work already done, one vaccine company, BioNTech, say they can update their vaccine in just six weeks to respond to any new variant that reduces efficacy. In the future, this could become more like traditional flu vaccinations, which are updated each year. But with the SARS-CoV-2 virus currently running rampant around the world, is there any way to prevent new vaccine-resistant variants evolving?
there's no way to prevent mutations. Mutations are just going to occur. What is important to do in that context is that we make sure that we are continually doing surveillance and sequencing the virus to ensure that we're really aware of any mutations that are coming to light. Now, it's important to note that most of the same precautions that we already have will still be effective. This doesn't change how the virus spreads. So wearing masks are still effective, keeping distance from others, avoiding crowded indoor spaces, all the things that we've heard about for many months now, these are still effective. 